Good morning, and let me welcome you to the Crossings Church on this Sunday morning. We are really glad that you're here, and we were glad because we really do believe that God brought you here to make a difference in your life, that he might bless you, and that that blessing would not be something that you hoard, but something that you would share with others. So welcome to the Crossings and what God is trying to do in all of our lives. Uh, it's good to be back with you. A couple of weeks ago, Carrie preached, and I was here. Last week, I was in Dallas uh, on a seminar. And it was pretty encouraging being down there, honestly. I uh, got to spend some time with my brother who lives in Houston, and he drove over. And uh, he is a partial quadriplegic, and we don't get to spend a lot of time together. And, you know, he's 68 this week, and I'm going, man, I don't know how much longer I'd get the opportunity. So that was good. But even more than that, I got to spend time with a church down there that is led by a, uh, one of the guys that was at camp with me years ago that I've served as a mentor through the years. And they have grown, and they have planted a church, and are talking about planning another one, and it's just encouraging to see what God is doing outside of what he's doing here. And I believe he's doing some great things here, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Before we jump into the lesson, I want to remind all the men that our men's retreat is coming up next weekend, and we have lots of space there that we can, that we can expand into. So if you haven't got a chance to sign up for the men's retreat, there is information on our website, on our Facebook page, and on the back of your bulletin. And it's an incredible time of being lifted up and of challenging and, and enjoying whether you like basketball or fishing in Lake of the Ozarks, there's all those things that are available. Great fun with an even greater purpose. So let me encourage you guys to, to sign up for that and bring a friend with you because it's a great place to introduce people to Jesus. Also, before we jump into the lesson, we always want to recognize when someone makes a commitment to Christ and decides to surrender their life to him. In this last week or two, we've got uh, two or three that, uh, of the books that we hand out because we study the Bible. The Bible says that faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard when someone shares it. And so that's the process by which people Jesus reaches people. He uses disciples to reach people, Christians to reach people, and then those people become Christians, and they're designed to reach someone else. The Bible always says that whenever we are Christians, we ought to crave the Word of God like newborn babies. It pictures the new birth or being saved as being born again, as being a little baby, even though you're a full-grown adult, you're a baby in the faith. And there are some things that you need to do to make sure that you grow. One of the things that we try to do to help them is taking them through the baby believer's first few weeks. And we want it to be an emphasis. Somebody says, do you think we ought to rename that? And I said, no, I don't want to rename it because when a baby came into my house, whenever Carrie was born, everything changes. And my priorities became less important because I wanted this baby to do well. When Ashley was born, it was about Ashley for a long time. Carrie slept for, after nine days, slept all night. Ashley was like a year and a half before she slept all night. And there were times when I was tired, when Reed was tired, but we always got up because the baby is what matters. I'm responsible. In the same way in this church, the baby is what matters. And all of you play some role, whether it would just being a good example to them or whether you're the one that's going to walk them through this book. You play a role as they watch you, as they listen to you, and what they will become. And so this last week, uh, Holly uh, Dial was baptized into Christ. Where's Holly? And Shanice, where's Shanice and Mackenzie? Shanice, stand up. Where are you at? Go ahead, stand up. Mackenzie, where's Mackenzie? Come on, stand up. No, that, you're not standing up. Okay. Be a good example for your, for your sister here. And, all right. But uh, they will take you through this book, and we are super glad that you're here. And if I knew something to embarrass you with, I would, but I don't. So, okay. But welcome to the family. Also, this last week, Morgan Vaccaro. I may say that wrong. Come on up, Morgan. And again, Shanice, you can stand up, and so can uh, Jenny. Where's Jenny? They study the Bible with her. And we have them stand up because, you see, there isn't someone converted unless there's someone that is reaching out to work with them. And it is important that we know that in the New Testament, when you read about the reaching of the lost, it was every believer's responsibility. So we are excited about Morgan being here, and these girls will walk you through that, all right? And welcome your new baby sister, Morgan, all right? <laughs> And next uh, is Max Barbie. Yeah. Come on up, Max. 
I didn't know Max until we ate at Cracker Barrel the other night together. But Max, uh, <laughs> Max, uh, it was Jackson and Caleb Jackson. Caleb, stand up, Jackson. That means you stand up and Caleb. And we are super glad you are the baby brother to everybody that's here. You know, he's the, he's the big baby brother, all right. But welcome to the family, man. Glad you're here. All right. Inside your worship bulletin is a set of notes that if you will... Pull them out. You can fill in some blanks. It gives you something to think about, to meditate on, and hopefully it'll help you during the week to continue to grow. We are in a series of lessons called To Be Continued. It's our theme for the year, and it's an examination of the church that the apostles that Jesus uh, equipped, that the apostles that Jesus trained, it's the church that they built. And it was a church that started off small, just like Jesus' ministry started with 12 men. These 12 men but it ended up exploding on the scenes, and after a few years, it was the dominant force in that culture. And we want to be that kind of church to where we are making a difference in the lives of others, that things are different because this church exists. It's not just about us coming together and to celebrate what Jesus has done. It's about us going out and making a difference and making that same difference in the lives of others. And so over this next several months, we'll be looking at characteristics of that church, learning things from them, saying, hey, if you want to do what they did, maybe you ought to, if you want to accomplish what they accomplished, you ought to do what they did. In Acts chapter 2, these are the, this is a description of that church right after it was birthed, right after they, the person became a Christian. Everybody that's mentioned in Acts 2, 46 through 47 are baby Christians. Now, that ought to be challenging for us because when we look at these things, if the apostles built a church, Jesus had just ascended, if this are the characteristics of the baby Christians then, then it ought to be the characteristics of the baby Christian now. And if it's not, then you've got to look at the more mature Christians and go, what's wrong? Because you're not modeling that. But here's a list of those characteristics, and I want you to, to pay attention to them. On your notes, they're underlined in categories. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, day after day, they met as a group in the temple, and they ate their meals together in homes, eating with glad and humble hearts, praising God and enjoying the good will of all people. And every day, the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. Now, there are several descriptions, traits cited within those two verses when you look at them. You know, one of the traits is that they met together day after day in, in, in the temple courts. Another is that they shared their meals together in their homes, eating with glad and humble parts. They were in the temple. They were in their homes. They were also praising God. They were enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And the last thing, probably the effect of all of that, and the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. Now, I got a bit of a, a, a trivia question for you in some sense. My mother loved Wheel of Fortune. She loved Jeopardy. She liked that kind of thing because she was smart. I didn't love them so much probably because of the opposite reason, you know, with, with her. But in Jeopardy, I always remember watching that show, and they will give a statement, and in Jeopardy, you have to answer with a question, right? It has to be, what is? Well, in Jeopardy, as we study this morning, we're going to study a church that's in Jeopardy. They're in danger. But in Jeopardy, if, you were to, if this were asked, or if this statement was made, what would the answer be? Of the Acts church trait cited in Acts 2, 46 through 47, this was the first to end. Now imagine music is playing in the background so you can think about your answer and you're getting to write it, read, ready to write it down. Of the Acts church trait cited in Acts 2, 46 through 47, the verses we just read, this one was the first to end. In Jeopardy, you would form a question that reveals the answer. And so I want you to think about it. Which one of those was the first to go? Because some of them did disappear. But one of them disappears relatively quickly, and that is, here is uh, the Acts Church traits cited, which is the first to go. That would be, what is enjoying the goodwill of all the people? By Acts chapter 3, you see the church becoming a group of people that are being criticized by a few religious leaders. By Acts chapter 6, you see that growing to where there are Christians being martyred. Over the next chapter, several chapters, you'll see that grow to where the church is being persecuted wherever it goes. And by the end of the book of Acts, you see the Roman government giving its full weight to help also persecute the church. So it disappeared. And, and, and so as we look at that, it's important for us to ask, okay, what's going on there? And, and this lesson that I'm doing today, I'm doing 
uh, this lesson in two parts, okay? Uh, the first, two, two or three reasons for that. The first reason is whenever I looked at my notes, I thought, if I preach a lesson that long, they won't like me anymore. And that's not a good thing, okay? So I cut it in half, and we'll get the second half next week. But more than that is the topic that we're addressing today is an issue that we face in increasing measure. You see, persecution is defined as hostility or ill treatment. The ultimate degree of persecution would be to be martyred, to die for your faith, whether that would be by the sword or in the Roman Empire with the Christians where you would be brought to the Colosseum and you would be a sport for the lions to be able to chase you around until they consume your body. And while we're no, in, no imminent threat of being fed to the lions in the United States of America, we are at high risk of facing hostility or ill treatment. It is going to increase, I promise you. But if you're familiar with what's going on behind the scenes, it is already going on because attitudes always precede actions. A man named George Yancey wrote a book about Christians and how the culture is feeling about them. He entitled the book, So Many Christians, So Few Lions, as if we wish there were more lions. Yancey documents several things in that book, but he, one of the first things he does is this, he, he documents through surveys and research, this is how the culture is feeling about you. The book is, is, is several years old now, I believe, but in that documentation, in those surveys, he found that 30%, 32% of all Americans like conservative Christians, fundamental Christians, which we would include ourselves within that group, 32% of all Americans like conservative Christians significantly less than other social groups. Then when they listed a bunch of social groups, we, 32% of, of the people said, I like those groups much better than I like this group. And if you want some kind of maybe some kind of perspective in that same survey, they, uh, uh, Yancey discovered that Muslims were viewed in comparison about 31% of all Americans like Muslims significantly less than other social groups. Now when you look at the, the, the kind of radical Islamic faith that's out there with all the things that go on in the world, the things that have happened with our culture, you would think that there would be some discrepancy greater than 1% in how people viewed the Islamic faith as opposed to the Christian faith. Because at least in the most recent of times, the Christian faith has not been responsible for those kinds of things. And yet when we look at the general level of this survey, they came to the conclusion that there is very little difference in how they, someone would view someone who is Islamic and someone who is Christian. Yancey also sent out a questionnaire with open-ended questions to a group of progressives who tended to be white, male, wealthy, educated, and non-religious. They were the type of people, honestly, if you would look at the, the when I say non-religious, they were the type of people one would expect to not align with the Christian worldview. And in the survey, they didn't. On the second question, one about the nature of those who don't like Christians, it was do they, do they merely feel mild disgust or is it irrational hatred that could lead to discrimination or persecution? Here are some of the answers that he got in response when he sent it out, describing how they feel about Christians and what they do. One respondent said, kill them all, let their God, lower G, let their God sort them out. Another respondent said, a torturous death would be too good for them. A third response said, I'd be a bit giddy, certainly grateful if everyone who saw himself or herself in that category were snatched permanently from our social peripheries, whether by holocaust rapture or plague. He basically says, I'd be happy if you get rid of them and I don't care how you get rid of them. And then another respondent said, I'm only too well aware of their horrific attitudes and beliefs and those are enough to make me see them as subhuman. Now again, as you, as, as you look at that, you're going, man, that, that is, that's a harsh critique. And if you're aware of really what's going on behind the scenes, the view of Christianity, the treatment for things that go on when you stand up for what you believe as a Christian, you know that kind of disdain is growing. But the good news is, is that the church that we are studying, this church that's in the book of Acts, 
they did not exist in a vacuum. As a matter of fact, they existed in one of the most hostile environments as far as Christianity that has ever existed. The dominant world religion at that time or the dominant religion that they were associated with, Judaism was fiercely against them and the most, one of the most powerful regimes in all of history, the Roman government also made them their target. The good news is that in spite of that, they existed They didn't simply survive, they thrived in that kind of hostile environment. And that's good news for you and I because sometimes we will excuse our lack of effectiveness. We will excuse our lack of influence because of the culture out there. And what this first century church seemed to understand is that the only thing that they could do, they can't make anybody do anything, but those outsiders could not prevent them from being influential as long as they carried certain traits inside of themselves, inside of the culture. So when we talk about do it again, the theme for our year, it's fitting that we are a church that lives in a culture of growing disdain, but we're modeling after one that grew up in an environment of incredible hatred, open disdain, and persecution. And it really brings us into going, okay, what do you do when the world doesn't like us anymore what do you like it when the world doesn't like us what do you do when it doesn't like us anymore there was a time in our culture where we were maybe respected there was a time when we were tolerated but there was very few that times where we were where we were openly disliked by the large group of the population and i would say now respect is among the very few tolerated is the majority and a significant group dislike Christians totally. So what do you do when that happens? And we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4 over the next couple of weeks along with a lot of other scriptures. But Acts chapter 3, there's a story that if you were here last week, uh, Carrie, my son, preached about, and it's a story of the healing of a beggar who is outside of the temple. As he comes, as Peter and John, the apostles, come before them, he asked for money because that's how beggars survived in that day on the, on the charity, the goodwill of the people that would come to the temple. Peter looks at him and says, I don't have any silver or gold, but such as I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, arise and walk. And it just seems to be something, it's either the biggest charade of some counterfeit miracle that can't be verified or something really happened. And the good thing about this is, and and the miracles in the first century are so verifiable that often that Jesus would pick those that were best known and well known, and I think he did that to add to the validity of that. And all of a sudden, a guy that everybody, friends and critics alike, knew that this guy was crippled before, and now he is walking and praising God. And it ought to be a really good thing, but it ignites a criticism that turns to a persecution. And that's where he asks, what do you do when the world doesn't like you? And we'll look at what they did. Over the next couple of weeks, we're just going to ask and answer a couple of questions, two or three questions that are significant, or or at least answer that question, what do you do when the world doesn't like us anymore? And by the way, what do you do when the world doesn't like us? There's nothing that you can do about us, right? There's nothing I can do about us. All I can do is something about me. But if we get enough me's working on these things, then we become powerful. The only way that this can make a difference is if we individualize this. So as we look at the answers, it's not going to be what we can do, but it's going to be about what I can do. So what do I do when the world doesn't like me anymore? Number one, I determine why and respond decisively. Why don't they like me? Whenever I was young, I had a great interest in having girls like me. I was not overly effective in it, but I was really interested in it, okay? And if they didn't like me, I would like to know why. Because if it's the clothing that I wear, I can change. If it's the smell that I emit, I can bathe. If it's the hairstyle that I wear, I can get a haircut. But if they wanted, when I was in eighth grade, if they wanted a six foot two guy, I knew the relationship was over with, okay? 
Because there ain't nothing I can do about that, okay? The genetics win that battle and I lose the girl again, all right? There are some things that we have to recognize when we ask the question why. There are some things that we can't do anything about and quite frankly don't want to do anything about. But there are some things that we should do things about. And I want to break those down into two categories for you to examine this morning. But I want to read 1 Peter 4 verses 14 and 15. Remember, Peter is the one that healed the guy in Acts chapter 3 and 4. He is the first one to be in prison and questioned because of what happened. The much more mature Peter later on looks back on his experiences, uses them for the benefit of others, and he's in a church when he writes these words. He's writing to church saying, hey, I've been there, done that. Here's what you need to learn. And he says this, count it a blessing when you suffer for being a Christian. So he goes, hey, you know, there are times when you're going to suffer for being like Christ. And when that happens, you ought to go, praise God, it is a blessing that I get to do that. And there are legitimately times whenever we as Christians are, we're just, somebody doesn't like us because we're being just like Christ. And what Peter says, when you do that, you ought to count it a blessing because this shows that God's glorious spirit is with you. In the New Testament, the greatest mark of the Spirit leading someone or filling somebody was not about the ability to do the miraculous, but it was really about their ability to do the mundane, simply to obey Jesus and follow his example everywhere they were. He goes, you've got the Spirit in you, understand, you don't get arrogant about this, count it a blessing, you're being just like Jesus. But then comes verse 15, but when you deserve to suffer... There's a big difference whenever you're a victim of suffering and when you volunteer for suffering, right? Whenever I was in fifth grade, I think, I had a school teacher who became very, I always had school teachers who became very frustrated with me, okay? <laughs> Wherever I was. But this one became particularly, and he was a very experienced school teacher. He was a nice guy. Sometimes not real wise, and I'll tell you why he wasn't wise here in a second. But he was so frustrated, frustrated with my immature behavior that I was acting like a baby that he decided that he would take a table cover that happened to be in his classroom whenever I was in it, and he would fold it up like a diaper and pin it to me during class. And not only did he have this diaper that he fashions for me that he put on me, he then brought a stool to the front of the classroom and had me set on the stool with it. Now, up until that point, I'm thinking, okay, this is a little bear, embarrassing, but who I was then, I'm going, yeah, but everybody's looking at me. That could, you know, maybe there'll be a girl that likes it. You know what I'm saying? If any girl happens to like diapers, this is the moment I've got a chance, you know? His mistake, his, his unwise mistake was the next thing he did. If he was trying to humiliate it, he lost me on this one because he gave me a slowpoke sucker. You ever saw the slowpoke? They're like a, a sugar baby, and it's just sweet, and it takes a long time. I would have wore the diaper every day if I could have a slow poke supper, <laughs> sucker. I'm not really bothered. Let me eat candy during class and you can dress me however you want to. My mom found out who was a teacher in the same school system and she was angry. Went to the teacher, went to the school board, my father who was a part of the school board. And it came to where they made the decision that you have to issue an apology to Robert. And so the teacher in front of the school said, the other day I did something and I really shouldn't have, so I want to apologize to Robert. And my only my thought when he said that was, does this mean I don't get any more suckers? You know, so I was very, very kind of immature in my response. But he apologized. And my mom felt very vindicated, but my dad took a different tack. He said, Robert, I don't think your teacher probably should have done that. But here's what I know. You act like a baby all the time. You're going to be treated like a baby the rest of your life. So how about rather than have to have somebody mad at your teacher, why don't you grow up and act like a fifth grader at least? Because quite frankly, you got what you deserved. Now, believe it or not, that was much better for me than all the anger at someone else because I was able to deflect in all of that. But my point with my father, he goes, you know, sometimes you deserve what you get. And we live in a victim mentality, and while there are genuine victims, but sometimes we're not victims for what we get. We volunteered for that. So the question is, if I'm going to deal with this, if the world is like me, I've got to ask, I've got to determine why and respond decisively. Now, it may be the first option, and I'm going to give you just two, broadly inclusive, all right? I may be disliked because of my hypocrisy. One of the things that you see 
in every survey that has been done for decades about people rejecting Christianity, one of the things that they point out is the hypocrisy of those that are living within it. Now that word hypocrisy was used over and over. Jesus used it numerous times in one chapter. It came, it was used most in Jesus' day to describe actors in the theater, in Greek tragedy or Greek comedy. It literally means to play from behind a mask. If you've ever saw the little, you know, years ago that had the little mask on the ends of the sticks and you just put, a, you put it on and it covers you, they did that so that one player originally could play more than one role. But what hypocrisy is, it's when you wear that mask and what you are on stage is not what you are in real life. And it's something that Jesus confronted because he knew rightfully. My mom used to say, all the people who say they don't come to church because of hypocrisy, they're just trying to justify themselves. And part of them may be so, but when Jesus confronts those that are hypocritical in his day, he says, you as a hypocrite, you can block not only those that are making excuses and just justifying themselves by your hypocrisy, you can block those who are sincere and trying to find me when you play from behind a mask. And for us, that's when we show up on Sunday and we know the songs and we sing and we listen and we write and we go to group. But who we are in those settings are different than when we are isolated from those settings. That it is a mask that we wear. We are playing a character. We are playing a character in those situations. But when we are away from those situations, we reveal our character, who we really are. And Jesus is extremely, extremely hard on hypocrisy. Now, you need to know that hypocrisy is not weakness. Both Jesus and our world, are, they are both very sympathetic to a person who is genuinely weak and make mistakes. What Jesus and the world is not sympathetic to is those who claim and proclaim but don't walk the walk, that they demand of others what they're needing, what they demand of others, what they are unwilling to meet in their own private world, in their own private life. And from Jesus to every survey since that in the United States that I've ever read, hypocrisy is a damning thing. And as a matter of fact, when Jesus speaks to the Pharisees, he says, you don't enter the kingdom of heaven, nor do you allow those that are seeking to. It results in the hypocrite, if it's not dealt with, being lost along with the person who would have found Jesus if it not for the roadblock that the hypocrite left. And people just don't like hypocrites on any level. In religion or at work, it doesn't matter. So if it's that, you go, okay, I'm supposed to determine why they don't like me and respond decisively. Well, if I determine that I'm disliked because of my hypocrisy, my decipher response when I'm hypocritical is repentance. Repentance is a word that was that Jesus, it, it wasn't a religious word in its day. It just pulled out of the Greek language because it so sp specifically met the need. Repentance was a change of heart and mind that always manifests itself in a change of action. So for a person to repent of hypocrisy, it means they have a change of mind from being hypocritical. They acknowledge their weakness. What they were covering up, they are now confessing, and then they address that weakness. And whenever that kind of response, when somebody says, I'm sorry, I wish that I could have done better, but I wasn't being honest with you, and I was weak, and I was insecure, and I was foolish, but I'm telling you, I want to be better, so you can ask me anything, hold me accountable. I just, I want you to know I'm sorry, and I'm going to do better. I cannot tell you how responsive people are to that kind of honest weakness, that honest confession. They are exactly the opposite when it comes to hypocrisy. It makes you lose your influence, and the bad thing is, because you're playing a game, you get caught up in the game, and you don't even realize that everybody sees what you think they don't. So it may be that I'm disliked because of my hypocrisy. Secondly, it may be that I'm disliked because of my consistency. It may be I'm disliked because of my consistency. Now you're going, what in the world, what, what does that mean? Well, write down this, it's not on your notes, but 1 Peter 4, 4, that same Peter years later writes these verse to a group of Christians 
who had left their previous world and had consistently refused to re-enter that world. You know what I mean? They they had left. They were not hypocritical. They were consistently refusing to go back to that world. He said this in 1 Peter 4.4. Now those friends, your former friends, think it's strange that you no, no longer join them in all the wild and wasteful things they do. You see, for hypocrites, they never get this response because everybody that's at church or most people at church think they've left that world, but everybody they used to do the things with at the parties and the events, the things that they sneak out to do in the middle of the night and they lie, every, every one of their friends know that they still do it, that they're still involved. But these guys are the real deal. And their friends think it's strange that you no longer join with them in all the wild and wasteful things they do. And then the verse ends with this, and so they say bad things about you. Dude, I didn't expect, I'm consistent. Why are they saying bad things about me exactly? Because there are some people that your hypocrisy blocks them and they are able to justify their behavior by saying you're no better than me. And that other people don't want to change, so the way that they will deal with you is they will try to bring you down to their level, and they will try to tear you down. But here's the thing. Whenever I am reject, whenever I'm disliked because of hypocrisy, the answer is repentance. Whenever I am disliked because of my consistency, the answer, my disciple response when I'm consistent is persistence. Mark Twain said this. He said, few things are harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. Right? You don't have to look at Mark Twain. I've watched it through the years. I've watched his people in youth groups and college groups. They get angry at somebody because somebody is not doing what they're doing or even busting them out for what they're doing. And so the hypocrite who doesn't want to be busted out becomes, in the consistent, becomes angry at the consistent person who is trying to help them out. And that battle can be some, can become so strong that the consistent person loses their consistency because of that. And the answer is persistence. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, the Apostle Paul wrote these words. And he wrote them to let us know that no matter what we do, we cannot always affect others the way that we want to. But we always need to make sure that we're doing the things that Christ calls us to because that's the only hope. He writes and he says, we Christians are the unmistakable scent of Christ. Other translations say we're the aroma of Christ. I don't know if you've ever had someone that you love pass away. And you had to go and select the clothes that they were going to wear. And now you're in grief and you pick up their clothes. And as you smell their clothes, you know it was theirs. It's the aroma of mom. It's the aroma, the perfume, or the cologne of dad. And even if you know that 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 was their clothes, you would would associate with them. And he says, we Christians have the unmistakable sin of Christ. And he says that scent is discernible alike to those who are being saved and to those who are heading for death. Over and over again, you'll see that the Bible has this very black and white kind of mentality where everybody is is in one of two groups. You're in a group that is being saved or you're in a group that is being lost. Those are the broad category that all of us fit into. So it says it's discernible to both groups alive. To the latter, it seems like the very smell of doom. To the former, it has the fresh fragrance of life itself. The same aroma. There are times when my wife will put on perfume in a store. And she'll smell it and she really likes it. And she'll come up to me and she'll have it and she sticks it in my nose. Do you like that? And I don't even have to answer because my gagging response lets her know the answer, okay? What is that? I've got a headache now. And it really is a weird phenomenon because she's going, do you like this? And I'm going, you know, the same, the same odor, the same essence, yet two completely different responses. 
Now, the word doom translated by the Phillips translation and almost every other translation says to the one they are the smell of death. The NIV says they are the stench. I like that word because that's pretty strong. They're the stench of death. And if you want to know what, what Paul is saying, there are some people, if, if you were in the Marvel universe, there are characters that you love, right? And then there are characters that elicit a different response across all lines, like Thanos, right? Nobody looks at Thanos with any kind of respect or, or any kind of uh, affection. He's the bad guy, and he's the bad guy wherever he is. Whenever Paul writes and says the way that the world views Christians is the way the Marvel universes, universe views Thanos. The Greek word, the smell of death, it's Thanatos. The Greek god of death, it's the word that the Marvel universe co-opted to describe this evil being that no one would like. And so he says there's a group of people out there that even when you have the aroma of Christ, you'll never be able to please them. It's not that they just don't like you. They really don't like Christ. They don't want him in their lives. And there's nothing you can do about that. You say, well, I'll just stop being the aroma of Christ. I'll just quit that stuff. No, you can't do that because there's a whole other group of people. Opposed to those who are repelled, they are attractive as they watch you and listen to you. And to you, you are the very sweet smell of life itself. In 1 Peter 3, again, Peter writes these words. He said, even if you suffer for doing what's right, you'll receive a blessing. Don't let them look down on you. Don't be, imitate, don't be intimidated. Yeah, they're going to view you as the smell of death, the stench, an agent of doom. But you don't be afraid of them. You don't be intimidated by them. How do you make sure that doesn't happen? He says, but exalt Jesus as Lord in your hearts. And always be ready to give a defense, humbly and respectably. Keep your conscience clear so those who ridicule your good conduct in the name of the anointed, of the anointed and say bad things about you, they'll be put to shame. Don't have somebody accuse you and you lie and you lie and you lie and you lie and then you get busted out and everybody goes, yeah, I thought you were a liar. Don't do that to your conscience. The Bible pictures the conscience as something that can become so hardened by misuse that you lose its ability to direct you. He says, make sure your conscience is clear. When you make a mistake, admit it and explain it and live for Christ vibrantly. The key to that is you making sure that Jesus is Lord, not you. And it's that very thing that got the first century church in trouble, is that they would not let anybody else be Lord. As you read through the story, what you come to realize is, I cannot control all the people. You can't control all the people. You're not responsible for them rejecting Christ unless you're modeling hypocrisy. And then you are, and someday, unless you don't repent of it, the Bible is clear, you will be held accounted for that. But you can't control people. But if I, if we persist in our godliness, if I persist in my godliness, I will win some and I will shame some. That's the only two to those who are, who are seeing me as the stench of death. Peter goes on to say in 1 Peter 2.15 that by doing good deeds consistently, you'll silence the talk of foolish people. I can save some, and I can shut some up by my example. That's why it's so important that I live in a way that's consistent. So I respond decisively. And as a follower of Christ, I persistently, if even annoyingly, nobody likes to be annoying. I've been called annoying a lot of my life. I've had teachers tell me that. Alex, you're like a fly. All you do is eat crap and bother people. That's what my freshman teacher told me. Only he didn't say crap, he said something else, okay. But with your sensitive ears, I won't say that, all right? That's not a compliment, can I tell you that? And I could laugh it off. 
If you ask your, your, a girl to go out with you and you say, and she says no, and you go, well, why not? And she says, you're really annoying. Not a good thing. I'm just telling you. The problem is the Christians have always, because of the message that they have, some are going to be viewing you as annoying. So you've got to be persistent, act persistently, even if it annoys them. And here's what you have to do that they did. You have to embrace Jesus as the final authority. I have to embrace Jesus as the final authority in all I say and do. That what I say, what I do, how I feel and how I act is not determined by the culture that dislikes me, but the Christ who died to save me. That he is going to be the one that controls my life. In Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, and I think your notes may say Acts chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. Did we get that next verse up there? In Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, Peter writes and says, that, that, that they, Luke writes about Peter and says, they called the apostles back in, they'd imprisoned them, released them, called them back in, and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. You cannot share the message of Christ. You can't do it on the college campus. A local university where our student organization is, we are not a recognized student organization. You want to know why? Because one clause in the contract, and that's an agreement to not evangelize, to share your faith with the students. All we have to do to embrace the funds that they would give us and to be back and be recognized in the good graces of the college is to say that we will not do what Jesus told us to do. It's the same thing that they are facing, and maybe you're like that in your grade school, your high school, maybe in your workplace. And I'm not suggesting being obnoxious or rude, but I'm also not suggesting that you be submissive to anyone other than Jesus. They called them back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. And by the way, in the name of means by the authority of. Whenever I was growing up, we had a lot of cop shows and somebody would run and they would say, stop in the name of the law. And when I was a little kid, I thought, well, what's the name of the law? And I didn't understand that that was a phrase that in our language means to stop based upon the authority of the law of the land. So they're saying you can't speak based upon what you think God, Christ, authorizes you to. You have to speak based upon what some human individual or entity allows you to speak. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? They just boil it down real simply. Sometimes we complicate things, sometimes because we really have questions, and sometimes we're looking for excuses. But they, hey, you, you, these are religious people, by the way, that the Roman government had given authority to rule this subculture of Judaism within Rome. And he looks at these religious priests and these statues and he goes, so let me get this straight. You're thinking that we should obey man rather than God, and you know that had to irritate them. But he doesn't even give them a chance to answer and says, we cannot stop telling about everything we've seen and heard. They're talking about the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not believe there was a resurrection, by the way. You had the Pharisees who were very arrogant. You had the Sadducees, and I remember my mom teaching me, you had the Sadducees, they were sad. You know why? Because they were Sadducee, because they didn't believe in a resurrection. But because they didn't believe in a resurrection, they didn't believe in an afterlife, they were very harsh in their discipline now. You see, we can say, Give it, leave it to God in the next world, he'll take his vengeance. They didn't believe that, so they were going to punish to the full extent of the law. They are the, temp- the Sadducees, the temple guards, were the ones that came and escorted Jesus out of the garden. They are probably the ones who helped oversee and protect, who would say, hey, let's make sure they don't think there's a resurrection, because they didn't want that to happen. And now Peter is proclaiming in the temple that Jesus resurrected from the dead. And they say, just stop it, just stop it. It'll be easy. Just stay quiet about Jesus and the resurrection. You can teach any philosophy, just don't teach that. And their answer was not a chance. Why? Because this was not simply something they imagined. They said, we are telling you what happened. Actually, we saw and we heard. 
We saw the dead body of Jesus, and we saw the living body of Jesus, and we got a commission for him to spread that message. So nothing you do will shut us up, because we believe if he resurrected, so will we. But in everything, whether you like us or not, if you like it, we'd love it. If you hate us, we're still going to do it. He is our Lord, and we cannot stop telling about everything we've seen and heard. And if you look what happens in the rest of Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, here's what happened, and you see them going on. First of all, you see it's by the authority of Jesus that they, it's by the authority of Jesus that I do good deeds. I'm commanded to do good deeds. The sharing of my faith, the helping of the weak, everything I do, I don't do it because Jesus suggested it, but because he is commanded, it's by his authority. On your notes, you have the text from last week. And it tells the story of Peter and John going to the temple. And in the middle of it, in verse 6, you say, Peter said, as he asked him, I don't have anything to give to you that's got any gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. In Acts chapter 4, when he's before the people that are judging him and trying him, he, go, he asks him, he says, he says, am I being judged for an act of kindness to a, to a, to a handicapped man? He's going, I, I healed a, a crippled man, and all of a sudden I'm going to prison, a bad thing, a good thing became bad, and here's the answer, yes, you are. Because when the culture hates you, a good thing that has Jesus' a name attached to it will be a bad thing. If you don't believe that, try being pro-life and stand up for the unborn, a good thing. But if you attach the name of Jesus, you become one of those religious bigots there. When you look at some of the things that go on with our culture, there are hospitals that they're threatening to shut down simply because they will not provide abortion services because of their religious conviction. There are places in our culture that have been adoption agencies for a year that have helped the most unfortunate of kids, the most troubled of kids, those from crack-addicted families that were born with, with, with withdrawal, that they have found ho houses and homes for them forever. But recently, their right to provide adoptions have been snatched away because they do not believe in abortion because of their faith in Jesus. And those are two extreme things that I can assure you there are a hundred other things probably that you are familiar with that go on that because it's got the name of Jesus, it is now not a good thing, it's a bad thing. But here's the thing. I did not get my authorization from them. And like a sergeant in the military who has been or a, who has given an assignment to, to, to the privates, Nobody else shouting at them in the world is going to change that order. We are authorized by God to do good deeds in order to glorify Jesus. And no matter what the world thinks, it doesn't matter what they think. It does matter what Jesus says. It's in the name of Jesus that they, it's in the name of Jesus that I glorify Jesus. Peter saw this opportunity and addressed the crowd, people of Israel. Why is this so surprising to you? And why do you stare at us as though we made this man walk by our own power and goodness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors who brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. You see, the most important thing for the apostles was not acceptance of culture, but it was the glorification of Christ. And if we're honest, we can really struggle with that. For me, with a background that created insecurity, thinking something was wrong with me all my life when I was a kid, always wanting somebody to like me, I rejected Christianity, not because I didn't think Christ was a good guy, but I knew that even then, with the people I'm hanging out, if I'm hanging with them, I'm not a good guy because I'm going to be different than them. But here's the thing. The way that God designed to glorify Jesus was by my living for him, even when the culture says don't do it. Even if I am rejected and reach nobody, I glorify God. And we need to get back to this reality. It is the most solid motivation. Because if I'm motivated by my own glorification when people reject me, I'll quit. If I am motivated by my effectiveness in reaching people and I'm ineffective, I'll quit. 
But the one motivation that stands in those, if I am motivated by the glorifying of God and I'm standing up for him regardless of what the world does, my motive and energy are intact. I glorify glorify Jesus in Jesus by Jesus' authority. It's in the name of Jesus that I confront sin. He says, why are you surprised for this? Man, God's got this all along. And then he says this, this is the same Jesus, if they didn't know this, this is the same Jesus who you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite his decision to release him. You didn't just reject him, you overrode Pilate. You rejected his holy, righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. Man, he's just, do you guys know what you've done? This, you've got to get this straight. This matters. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses to this fact. Why won't they back down? Because it's not a fantasy. It's a fact. It's verifiable. All 12 of the guys that are with the apostles as they go to the temple, all 12 of them, 11 of the 12, will die a martyr's death rather than deny You don't die for a lie that you know is a lie, and the only other one, John, will die in isolation on an island where he wrote the book of Revelation, where they kept him away from anybody else. And he confronts them and says, listen, we know this is a fact. You killed him. He resurrected. We saw it. You rejected God. And they point out to the religious elite the depravity, the emptiness of their religion. Because they're more interested in tradition than in protecting their tradition than being what Christ called them to. But here's the thing. As they do it, they do it by the authority of Christ. And they do it to glorify Christ. And they don't do it because they're mad at the religious leaders. They do it, they proclaim it, they point out their sin because they want the religious leaders to find life. If it dead ended there, that would be the end of it. But you're going to find out that their motive was always to benefit the person that they confronted. You see, sometimes that we don't, we don't, we don't get that, do we? When somebody says something hard to us, we immediately begin to put them in at least the iffy category and often the enemy category. The great theologian Ted Lasso said to a person he was working with. I cannot be your mentor if I'm not occasionally your tormentor. Great line. A true line, right? Look at Jesus. There are times when you look at what he says to Peter or James or John. There are times some of the guys when I was in ministry when Mike would say some things that were pretty hard. But he can't be the mentor unless you be the tormentor. But the problem is often when we feel tormented, we make a judgment not about the condition of our heart, but about the condition of the person who confronts us. And that's why it's really important that you and I keep our motive together because there's enough skepticism already. We've got to make sure that when we call out sin, we're doing it to glorify God by his authority. So rather than being mad when somebody rejects it, rather than being angry with them and throwing stones, maybe we could just be sad and heartbroken. And I'm thinking that a sad person, a heartbroken person over that response has a lot more likelihood to reach the person rather than someone who is mad. I have the authority from Jesus to call out sin. I don't have the authority to take vengeance. And that's a good thing. And finally, in the name of Jesus, and here's a big one, alone. It's in the name of Jesus alone that I offer salvation. That seems awfully narrow. Yeah, Jesus kind of said that. Remember in his Sermon on the Mount, he said really early on, he said, you know, there are two roads. There's not 26 roads to heaven. There are only two roads. And again, this broad view, black and white view within Christianity says there's one road that leads to heaven. And that road is narrow and very few people are on that. There's also a broad road that leads to destruction. And many people find that. So the idea, as he proclaims to these very religious people, that the only way you guys can be saved is to surrender to Jesus is narrow 
and offensive unless it's true. We showed a video several years ago of an atheistic comic. You know the duo Penn and Teller. Penn is a avowed atheist. He does not believe that there is a God. But he tells the story of a man coming to his show who asked if he could talk to him afterwards. And he said, because he was so nice and so kind, I decided that I'd say yes. And so when he talked to me, he complimented me on my show, told me he really enjoyed my, my comedy. And he said, I don't know if he knew I was an atheist. I believe he was. And then he asked me if he could give me a Bible. And he'd wrote some little inscription inside of it, and he said, you know, that, 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 that was, it. but he said, and, and as he gave me this, he wasn't some radical weirdo preaching, he was just very kind and seemed very concerned and very caring. And he said, I've had people ask me, well, does that offend you when somebody gives you or approaches you like that? He said, because it has happened before. And he said, here's what I believe, that if I stood before my audience and I believed that I had a solution to a problem that was going to negatively affect them, if all my audience was going to go to hell and I had the answer, it would not be unkind to share that. It would only be kindness. Because if you believe what you're saying, that there is a hell that is going to be left for all those who don't embrace Jesus, he says, how much do you have to hate someone to not share that message. It is narrow. But what if it is the words of God? And these guys have watched a corpse resurrect and perform miracles and ascend into heaven. In Acts chapter 3, he says, friends, friends to the people that had imprisoned him, beat him, or were going to beat them, Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Now repent of your sin and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. This is not over for you guys. But here's what you got to get. You've got to embrace Jesus as Lord, which means master. Anointed, the word Messiah means anointed one to the Jews. It meant king, anointed king. Every king of Israel was anointed before they were installed. When, so when it says anointed, when it says Messiah, know what it's talking about. They're looking forward to king who will save them from their problems, which they thought was the Roman government. Peter says your problem is your sin. But it's not simply a matter of saying, okay, I'll accept Jesus as Savior. That's not offered. But it is the faith in Jesus for who he is. He is both Lord and the saving king. But understand, to have a relationship with Jesus meant that Jesus was in control of your life. And if you have been someone who says, I got a relationship with Jesus, but I've never really submitted to Jesus as Lord and King, you find yourself in the same situation as these men to where you need someone to show you again and send you again to Jesus, the real anointed Messiah. In Acts 2, similar language, Peter stands up and says, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ or Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will save. The solution to sin is the narrow message that Jesus is Lord in Christ. That's why in Acts chapter 4, some of the last things that Peter will say to these people is this. There is no one else who has the power to save us, period. No one. For there is only one name to whom God has given the authority by which we must experience salvation. The name, the authority of Jesus. And the same is true then that was true then is true now. Only submission, faith in Jesus as Lord and King.
is your only hope of salvation. Would you bow and pray with me? Father, in, in the people's, God, you know this, it's a kind of a prayer announcement, I guess, God, there is a communication card inside of the bulletins every week. And Father, that communication card is a chance for the people to acknowledge their need, whether they have just been struggling and honest or hypocritical and deceptive, but maybe this morning they've come to the awareness. Maybe not exactly what that need is, but they have a need. May they need to check out and see if Jesus' resurrection and who he claimed he was is a fact or just a carefully created myth. You said that faith is solidified when people look at the scriptures and they look at the scriptures as someone shares them with them. Maybe they don't really know if they believe completely, but they know they want their life to be different. They can just check out like a personal Bible study on that card. For others, they've studied the Bible, and the problem with them is not that there's not clear evidence. Man, these guys that, G, that Peter is talking to, many of them had certainly seen the resurrected Jesus. There was never historically a search for the body, and that's because the Bible says there's over 500 people who saw Jesus alive after the resurrection. You don't short search for a corpse when you have saw the person walking among you. But in spite of all of that, they would not surrender to Jesus. And Father, we have people today that, you know, they'd be cool to have a Savior, but they're not going to surrender to a King or a Messiah. And in doing so, they miss the blessing of having a master that knows what's best for them, controlling their life. But they also miss the Savior part. Because you can't have a Savior if you won't have a Lord. And so if, if there are people here that say, man, I'm ready to make him my Lord, Father, that happened in the first century church as they would make that commitment to be immersed in water. Peter said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. But, Father, baptism was more a dunk in water. Romans 6 makes it clear that it was a death to self-trust and a surrender to trusting Jesus to rule our lives. For others, maybe this morning there's just issues they have that make them have doubts about God, a difficult past, Father, that, that confuses them. We've got some great things, some people who have experienced abuse and addiction and anger issues that you have helped Father, to save from themselves. And there is hope. And Father, maybe for the congregation that we would just be alerted to the fact that showing up on Sunday mornings does not impress Jesus. Especially if there is a duplicity, that what a difference in between how we live and how we act on Sunday morning and how we leave outside of the assembly. And maybe the greatest thing that, that some could do this morning is to say, I'm tired of, of playing from behind a mask. I want to acknowledge my weakness and my hypocrisy, and I want to get help. And Father, I know that you put them in a great place in the crossings to find that help. So for whatever it is, God, I pray as our worship team says this next song, that we will use it as time of meditation to think, what, Jesus, what God do you want me to do in response? That we'll then fill out that card and drop it in the basket. For our guests, we ask only for the card. We ask them not to give money. For our members, we need their card and their contribution to keep the ministry going. But Father, right now, we ask that you would work in our lives and we would move as you act in our lives to do what you would want us to do, whatever that would look like, Father. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.